Kathy. Father, uh, we do look forward today to what you're going to do. And God, we come to worship you. And Lord, we do thank you that we can come in without, without fear of, of uh, retaliation or without fear of, of uh, being arrested or being drug out. And God, we do look forward today to what you have for us. We came here today seeking you. We want to hear from you. God, we want you to speak to our hearts, to change us. We want to be molded into that image that you desire for us to be. So God, I do pray that you'd remove any obstacles, anything maybe going on in our mind right now and, and in our hearts, that you could get those out of the way so we could hear from you and that this would be a beneficial time. It'd be profitable for us spiritually. And we can go away knowing that we've sat in the presence of our God, knowing that you've been there and you've touched our hearts and you've ministered to us. And we thank you so much that we get to come to you and that we can gather together and read your word and hear from you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, where we left off, you have to remember, it was a pretty exciting time, right? Jesus has revealed himself to the, to the 12 and Peter made that tremendous declaration. And, I, you know, I, I, I think of that scene, man, and everybody's got to be way up here. I don't know about you guys, but, you know, there's sometimes you walk with the Lord, and, and, man, he does something incredible in your life, and you just think, it can't get any better than this. I could go to heaven right now because this is it, right? And then a couple years later, he maybe does another thing. But, but listen, man, this had to be that moment. Think about it. They found the Messiah, just kind of let that seep in your heart. These 12 are tucked away up by that place and some of us have been there, some of us are going there. Caesarea Philippi, you're there in that huge cliff and you can hear the trickling water go by and, and man, and Jesus said, you know what, Simon, you're right. I am the Messiah. And man, just the, woo, the excitement. But here's the problem. They had a different definition of Messiah than what the Bible had. And you see, that happens to us often. We do something and something happens and we may be all excited about it, but you know what? It's in some ways misplaced emotion because it's not what the Bible says. And we need to know something. Our experience does not trump the Bible. The Bible trumps our experience. So as I think of these guys, listen, I think of these guys and how excited they are, but in their minds, they had a man-made Messiah. They had their own idea. Maybe they've been taught by certain rabbis, but they had their own idea of what the Messiah should be. And man, when we start letting man's ways get mixed up with God's ways, we get in trouble. Isaiah the prophet wrote this. This is, this is a verse I love and, and I, I like to meditate on. God said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In Isaiah 55, listen, man, how powerful that is. And hey, God lives outside of time and space. That's a mind tripper. Listen, man, that is hard to get our heads around. Thursday night we had a Q&A and somebody asked something and you know you gotta you gotta explain it this way everything with God is now there's no future and there's no past it's all now that's hard for us to do right we can't just think that way we can't say everything is now even if you're from Bisbee you can't do it you know you, you just can't go there so so listen we need to trust him even in the hard times, even in the difficult times, even in the times where we can't put it together and it makes no logical sense to us, we got to trust him. And that's what's going on here. So listen, man, he just had that great revelation. Everybody's kind of dancing. I think they were dancing. Maybe you don't think Christians can dance, but I think they're dancing. I think they're having a time up there, man. And I think they're whooping and they're hollering. And, and man, everybody's excited. And then Jesus lays this on them. Look at verse 21. 
From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and he must be killed, and he must be raised on the third day. Now, I added must in there a lot of times because, listen, that is an important word. If you're a Bible marker, again, mark that word in your Bible. He must do these things. It's not an option. Listen carefully. God does not have plan B. He's got one plan, and that plan's going to work. So God doesn't have an alternative plan. He doesn't think, you know, hey, what if, what if this thing doesn't work out? Jesus must First of all, it's interesting, go to Jerusalem. Not go to New York City, not go to Rome, not go to Paris. He's got to go to Jerusalem because that's where this had to take place. There's no other option. And listen, man, I think of this, and, 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 and here's what I think. I think, you know, back in eternity past, before the foundations of the world, before anything ever began, there was this sort of dilemma, we'll call it, although God doesn't have a dilemma. I'm gonna create man and I love man, but man's gonna sin. And I can't wink at sin. I can't just ignore sin. Even the other night at the Q&A, somebody asked, why does, why does God not just forgive? And it's because he's holy and just and pure. And he can't, listen, he can't just say, oh, that's all right, I understand. He can't do that. We as parents do that sometimes, don't we? Little guys come to us and they blow it and, and, and you know, we go, oh, it's all right. You're five. Then they're 20 and we go, oh, it's all right. You're acting like you're five. <laughs> but God can't do that. You see, sin has consequences. And he cannot be a just God unless he deals with sin. The wages of sin is death. The Bible makes that very clear. And death is not so much physical, but separation from God. And so in my mind, and I know this isn't how it works, but this, this helps me think about it. In my mind, in eternity past, God knows he's gonna create, but he knows he's got this problem. And I kind of look at it this way. I kind of look at, then Jesus went, I'll do it, man. I'll do it. I volunteer. I'll take care of that sin. You know what? I'll go and I'll become a human and I'll live a sinless life and I'll be perfect and I'll die on the cross and then man can be set free. We can give him the thing that says paid in full. And it was done, huh? So listen carefully. From eternity past, Jesus had to go to Jerusalem. He had to be mistreated by the scribes and the Pharisees and, and uh, the, the uh, chief priests. And then he had to be killed. There was no other way. Now listen, I think they all heard that. I think they're kind of processing that, right? But I don't think they heard the very last must. And he must be raised on the third day. But do you ever get in a conversation and somebody's saying something and they hit that zinger thing where your mind goes, <laughs> and you don't hear the rest of it? I think 12 of them, I think even Judas, at this point, I think they all went, <laughs> and they didn't hear that he must be raised on the third day. So listen, man, all they're thinking of, this is insane, because listen, Jesus, you're the Messiah. We just declared that, don't you understand? You're gonna sit on the throne of David. You're gonna rule and reign. You're gonna deliver us from Rome. This isn't the Messiah we voted for. You, the Messiah we voted for is supposed to do this. This dying stuff isn't part of our, 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 our scheme. And I think they're just, like, they're just like buzzing. They're trying to process it. Because here's what I know. They were just like us. And sometimes somebody says something, man, and we just like, even here I watch sometimes some of you go, for a long time. <laughs> and so, Jesus says, but I must be raised on the third day. Man, I wish you would have got a hold of that. But they didn't. So Jesus lays that on him. Now listen, man, this was crazy. This is, this is like, I, well, look at, look at Peter's reaction. Peter says it all. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now don't you love this? Don't you love this? You know, I, I get this picture, right? Jesus, let's go over here. I got to talk to you. 
Don't you get, uh, hey, you got to admire Peter didn't like just blurt this one out, right? Come on, come on, I got, I got to let you in on something, man. You are out of your mind, you know? So he takes him aside and, and you know, it says, it says, and he said to him, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Do you hear his heart? He is sincere. He is 1,000% sincere. He rebuked God. That's a little weird. But all of us do it. Do you ever ask God why he let something happen to you? Do you ever tell him, why is this going on in my life? Yeah, well, that's kind of rebuking him instead of accepting what he's brought. So listen, man, Peter's going, you don't understand. You need to read your Bible. This is not the Messiah painted for us. And Jesus is going to tell him, dude, you need to read your Bible. So listen, man, that's bad concept. And, and think, about, think about some of us. We, we accept theology from men that is not always biblical. And then we begin to stand on it. And we begin to do things. And hey, saints, that's when we get in trouble. I remember when I went to Bible college and our director, one of, the, one of the first few weeks I was there, I remember him saying, you guys, you need, to, you need to get some good theology. You need to get grounded. But he says, but when your theology, not if, when your theology disagrees with scripture, change your theology. And that's an important thing we all need to remember because listen, we develop things. I've developed things. I've changed over the years. I've been doing this now almost 30 years and, and I've changed. That's why we destroy old teachings because I change. And so listen, we need to get in the word and let the word change us. And hey, we develop things. So, so listen, man, Pete tells him, I, I, this isn't the Messiah that I really signed up for. Now, once again, I don't think they're thinking you're jipping us. Here's what I think they're thinking. It's just wrong. So Jesus says to him, here's where it gets really crazy. Je but he, Jesus, turned to P and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Wow. Wow, man, I read that, and, and it's just like, five minutes ago, I was the one hearing from God, right? Remember that? Five minutes ago, you said, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my Father in heaven. Now, all of a sudden, you're calling me Satan? Like, what happened? And how many times, listen, listen, some people get all mad at Peter here. Hey, how many times have God really used you to do something, and then within Maybe minutes or hours, you say the stupidest thing ever. We all do that. And listen carefully, that doesn't disqualify you forever. Peter said something really bad here. But then he went on and preached in Acts chapter 2. Doesn't disqualify him. So listen, man, when Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, I think a couple things are going on. We could just say, get behind me because you're being an adversary right now. You're not being, a, you listen. You're not benefiting this ministry. You're being an adversary. You, what you are saying is what Satan would say if he could be here. How does Jesus know that? Because he's already been tempted by Satan, right? Remember when he tempted him in the wilderness and he looked for a better time? Satan thought this might be one of those better times. And he jumps on this. Listen, man, he jumps on this. So, so you need to understand, it's not, that, it's not that Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, you're the devil, He's saying you're thinking like the devil. You're acting like the devil. You you know, instead of stinking thinking, it was demonic thinking, right? Stop it. And then I like this idea. When he says get behind me, I don't think he's necessarily saying get out of here. Here's what I think he's saying. Pete, you need to get behind me and follow me, not in front of me to lead me. Get behind me. Because that's where you belong. You need to follow me. So listen, and then he says this, and I think this is the most hurtful part. You're, you are an offense to me, for you are mindful, you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Would to God that we could get that in our hearts, that we would understand, hey, when we take a stand on something, listen, I think we should be people of conviction. I think we should be people who take stands on things. I take stands on things, and, and hey, you can get in trouble doing that. I know that. But listen, man, we should be, if, if you don't have any convictions, then what are you? 
And so I get that, but when we find out our conviction might be wrong, it's okay to say, oh, I was wrong. I took that stand and I was wrong. But man, people have conviction about what you believe. And here he's saying, Peter, Peter said this with great conviction. He says, but here's the problem, Peter. You're not thinking the thoughts that God has. You're thinking the thoughts of man. You're thinking about what benefit. And we might even put it this way, because he's going to develop this here in a moment. He might even be saying it this way. Hey, Peter, you're just existing because you're just existing in this physical realm. That's all these disciples were thinking of at this point. Listen carefully, all they were thinking of was the physical. We need to set up the kingdom, we need to deliver Israel, we need to you know, get things going, and that's the direction we're going. That's all physical. And he says, quit thinking physically and just existing and start thinking spiritually and live. You see, the only way I believe people can live is by being spiritual beings. When we are born again, then life starts. You know, it's funny, we were talking in the back room and somebody said something about, you know, uh, uh, somebody said, hey, some of you guys, you know, walked in the world longer than I've been alive, so can you give me some help? And, you know, and it just, it just kind of, I, I just thought about that. And hey, when, when you're without the Lord, you're just existing. I don't care what you acquire. I don't care how much money you make. I don't care about the toys you get. I don't care, you're just existing. But man, when you find Jesus, you start living. And I, you know, I know that in my own life. I never wanna go back. I wanna go forward, so you start living. So he said, Peter, listen man, you're just, you're just thinking and you're letting man influence your thinking. Men's ways and men's ideas influence your thinking, not God. So that's pretty heavy. Now listen, I think again, I think they're all kinda of looking at him now like, uh, we kinda of just, we sort of agreed with Peter. Are you ever in a situation where somebody blurts something out and you kinda of like what they say and then it gets rebuked and you're thinking, all right, it's just like I was on their side. Now what am I going to do? And I think, listen, I think there's a lot of stuff going on here. And again, just, just realizing, hey, realizing these weren't a bunch of people in nice robes walking around like this all the time. These were just guys hanging out. They're out there and now they got, wow, and, and maybe even one of them said, seriously, Lord? And then he begins to explain what he's talking about. You see, now we kind of get into this whole thing. And so verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, listen, their heads didn't just go, their heads went. We read it and we don't, I, I, I don't think any of us really get the concept of taking up your cross. Historically, at the time of Christ, and I think it's the, the, the three years that he ministered, somebody wrote and said there were over 3,000 executions by crucifixion during that time period. People knew what that was about. Listen carefully, man. When he said you need to tick, pick up your cross, notice he didn't say my cross, your cross, and follow me, here's what Jesus is telling them. You need to die. Because when a person picked up a cross, you need to know something. They were never coming back. That was it. There was no, hey, you couldn't appeal. You didn't have the Supreme Court. You didn't have this court. Once you carried that cross, you're done. It's over. Imagine saying that to that group of guys. Hey, guys, you need to get your cross. Here's what he's saying, man. You need to die. You need to die. Wow, I'm not sure they had it all plugged in spiritually. But that was intense, man. I can't imagine what those guys were feeling. And here's what I'm thinking there. Here's what I would be thinking. Man, back up there at verse 19, it was pretty good. When we realized that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, everything like, everybody was smiling, we were dancing, woo, we were partying. Now it's not so much fun. Now he's serious. You need to deny yourself. The problem, the problem with, with that, most of us interpret that this way. I need to be someone who's in self-denial. That's not what he's talking about. 
See, self-denial is, hey, I'm gonna do away with something to make myself, you know, and, and hey, we might not eat chocolate, you know, the whole thing of Lent kind of is that way. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about you give something up. Here's what he's talking about. You die, you die, you die to self. Denying self is denying and following him, giving up your life and following him, throwing everything aside. You know, here's the amazing thing, Christianity, being born again, cost you nothing because Jesus paid everything. But in reality, it cost you everything. You gotta die to self. Now, here's an important thing. He's not telling us to, to, to die to who we are as far as the way we're made up and our personality and, and different things. Listen, God forbid that we would be just a bunch of cookie cutter Christians and all talk the same and act the same and think the same. And, and, and that's not what he's talking about because man, that would like freak me out. Because I like, I, I like the idea that we're a whole bunch of different people gathering together. And some of us are freaks. <laughs> that's good. But he's telling us we need to die to that old man, to that man in Adam. As I said, you know, I, I got saved later in life. I was 31 years old when I got saved. It was like five years ago. <laughs> so I was 31 when I got saved, and, and I don't ever want to go back. I don't. You know, I, I'm blessed in some ways to minister right by where I grew up and where I spent my, most of my life. And I get to minister. And it's interesting because some of you meet people that knew me. And, and, you know, some of you go, hey, so-and-so said to say hi. And, you know, and, and then, you know, they, they kind of say, he's pastoring? And people will even tell me that. I'll see some of my old uh, school buddies and, and people I hung out with, and they go, seriously, like, you're doing that? And I go, yeah, because that guy died. You see, that Pat died that you know, and he's gone. And I'm not gonna resurrect him. I'm not gonna bring him back. He's gone. And so this is what Jesus is telling us. Listen, this is important. To go far with the Lord and to live, listen carefully, to live, you gotta die. To that person, that old person has to die. And then he says, for whoever, verse 25, desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Here's what Jesus is saying, man. Hey, you can't, you can't live in both worlds. And some people try really, really hard. I watch some people who struggle with their Christianity and they're like trying to keep a foot in the world and a foot in Christianity and pretty soon man you're doing the splits and you're in serious trouble you can't do both Jesus says hey you got to choose one or the other now listen I understand we're in this world but does this world have a grip on you that's the question you know we were talking before before fellowship and some of the conversations we get into are like well, why are we even talking about this and we're talking about we're talking about some stuff going on in the world and and hey I'm like everybody else. I get a little uptight with stuff going on. But then I have to settle my heart and say, you know what? This world's fading away. And I know, I know the one who holds everything in his hand. So I'm okay. And I don't even have to vote for him. <laughs> so listen to what Jesus is saying, man. If you strive to stay, quote, status quo, you're gonna lose. You're gonna lose spiritually. I don't wanna lose spiritually. So let go, listen, let go of that old man or woman. But let go, he says, man, because what is it gonna profit you if you get the whole world and you lose your soul? All of that's gonna go away. And so we need to realize, man, listen, he's hitting really hard. And I think the disciples are going, man, I think I gotta be honest. Hey, if, if you're newer to the faith and you're reading this, you're going, this is freaking me out. Because I think it was freaking them out. Hey, they didn't have the whole New Testament. They didn't have any experience. They didn't have anything to look at. They just have this itinerant rabbi 
who they've been following for a couple of years just dropped this bombshell on him saying, yeah, I am the Messiah. Woo! But now I'm going to die. Boo! And listen, not only am I going to die, you all are going to die because you need to die to yourself. You need to deny yourself. And you need to take up your cross and you follow me. Because what good is it to gain everything in this world and lose your soul? And I think now they're going, Jesus, you're just freaking us out. Why are we even up here? I have a feeling like I, I love going to Caesarea Philippi when we do our Israel trips. I have a feeling these guys are thinking, I never want to come back to this place again. Like, this is the scariest place in the world. Oh, he's still not done. Now, some people say this was good news. I think it was good news for them. It's good news if you're born again. It's not good news if you're not. Verse 27, for he tells them the son of man. Remember, that's a title he liked. The son of man will come in the glory of, of I'm sorry, I, did I get, yeah. For the son of man will come in the glory of his father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Oh, Jesus is coming back. You know, I was raised in a religion that never talked about, well, we, they hardly talked about Jesus. But I never knew, no one ever told me Jesus was coming back. When I found out Jesus was coming back, I was shocked. I thought, I lived 31 years, no one ever told me this. Why don't people tell people that Jesus is coming back? I think that's important. Now, my dad used to say, this is kind of gross, but my dad, I remember my dad saying this, so-and-so thinks they're the second coming of Christ when he, when he didn't like somebody and they were all haughty, right? That's an old saying. My dad would go, oh, so-and-so. And that's, that's all I knew, and I didn't really know he was coming back. And you find out he's coming back, that's kind of a shocker. But listen carefully, he's not coming back as the savior of the world. He's coming back to judge. He's coming back on a horse. Woo! And he's gonna judge. Which side are you going to be on? That's the dilemma because he says, listen, he's going to come back and he's going to judge. Here it says, listen, he's going to uh, reward each according to his works. Now, I know, I know, listen, some people go, dude, we don't work for our salvation. Absolutely not. We don't. But he's still going to judge you for your works. What did you do? Listen, what did you do with the message about Jesus Christ? Either you're in or you're out. Listen, he's not going to look at every detail. I, I, I don't like those guys who say, when you get to heaven, there's going to be a big, uh, you know, video of your life streaming. God forbid. <laughs> that is not heaven. That might be going on in hell, but that is not heaven. Listen, if you're, if you're in Christ, your sins are covered. But what are the works? What is he talking about? I think he, listen, he's gonna look and by, listen, by your life, you're either declaring you're in Christ or out of Christ. And that's what he's gonna be looking for. If you're out of Christ, you're in serious trouble. But you need to know, man, if you're in Christ, there's no judgment. He's already taken that judgment. I think there's going to be rewards. I think the Bema seat, I don't think the Bema seat that Paul talks about in Corinthians, I don't think that's a, that's a judgment that people call. I think that's a reward center. And some are going to get some really big rewards. Some of us, some of us, if we're, we're really honest, we might get the little participation trophy. <laughs> that's it. Now, listen, it doesn't matter because my Bible says we're going to throw all those rewards at his feet anyway. So it's not like you're going to strut. Some people say, wait till I get to heaven, man. I'm going to have this stuff. No, you're not. You're getting the littlest trophy of all. But listen, we're going to give those up. But here Jesus is saying, the Son of Man is coming. And I believe, listen, I believe this was to kind of clarify the being raised on the third day. And he's letting them know, hey, here's kind of some shocking news, but here's a little bit of comforting news. I'm coming back. And I'm going to come back. Oh, and then one more. Um, you know, my, mine has verse 28 really separated from the rest. Like I have titles in my Bible. Some of you have titles in your Bible, and 28 is kind of separated from 27, from 24 through 27. And then you have a, uh, after 27, you have a title, and 28 is down by, by chapter 17, and people want to do that. Something you need to know. All the chapters and verses are not, they're not 
ordained of God. Man put those in there. Man put those in there so we could tell where we're at instead of me saying, hey, find the place in your Bible where it starts talking about this. We have chapters and verses so we can find it easy. That's not, you need to know, man, that's that's not ordained of God. It's just a simple, simple tool because I like to explain that because here's the thing. I believe, I believe some man-made theology kind of went into the way my Bible's laid out. They're wanting to push verse 28 down with 17 because they want to say 28's all about what's going on in 17. What's going to happen in 17 is there's going to be this miraculous, right, transformation of Jesus and he's going to be hanging out with three guys. That's an advertisement for next week. So he's going to be with these three guys. So that's going to happen. And they like to squish this in that. And I'll tell you why in a moment. I'm not, I'm not necessarily buying into that. And I don't like them manipulating me to think that way. So I'm going to keep 28 up with 27. He's just told him the Son of Man is coming back, right? And he's going to come back and he's going to reward each according to his works. Then verse 28, assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, or Mark says coming in his power. Now listen, I understand, that's a huge statement. But once again, Jesus has like laid all this other stuff out. Now he's trying to comfort them a little bit. And he's saying, you guys need to know something. Some of you standing here today are not gonna die before the Son of Man comes back with uh, showing his kingdom, expressing his kingdom, or in his power. And The theologians go, what on earth is he talking about? Because here's what I know. It's been almost 2,000 years and Jesus hasn't come back. So I'm positive he's not talking about that. That I know. He's not talking about his second coming in that verse. Because it's been 2,000 years. And hey, and then some people go, you think he made a mistake? Ay, ay, ay. Seriously? No, he didn't make a mistake. You think he misspoke? No, Jesus never misspoke. He's Jesus. Come on. So then we, now we have a dilemma. What is he talking about? Well, a lot of people think he's talking about chapter 17. When there's a transfiguration and they see him and they see him in his glory and then they see, you know, the two guys with him and I'm not going to tell you who they are so you have to come back next week. But anyway, when he sees Moses and Elijah with him and they're hanging out. <laughs> And remember, Peter gets into this whole thing. Peter does another bizarre Peter thing. And they do all that. And they go, well, obviously that's what he's talking about because we stuck that verse right by chapter 17 so you would know that's what he's talking about. He could be, could be. But I'm not completely sold on that. I believe the biggest thing he's talking about is what he started this whole conversation with. The Son of Man must go to Jerusalem He must be betrayed to the scribes and the Pharisees. He must die, and he must raise again on the third day. What did those guys witness, all of them except Judas? What did they witness? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. And don't tell me that wasn't coming in his power or his kingdom. When he rose from the dead, hey, you need to understand that was the most glorious thing ever in the history of humanity. And he rose up, listen, man, and, and hey, when he rose up, that was all part of his kingdom. That was all part of his, obviously, of his power. So I believe he's mostly talking about that because that's the context we have that we've been reading about. And so I think that's why some of you aren't going to die before you see me in that state. Oh, also, also, we could even jump ahead and say, he's probably talking about Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit comes and empowers all of them. So listen, but I, 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 I'm more towards his resurrection. Or if you want to be neutral, you could do this one. I, I read a bunch of guys did this. He's talking about all three. I go, come on. Then he could be. But I think mostly it's the resurrection. Why? Because that's what he's pointing. Listen, listen to what he's pointing these guys to. And what is the transfiguration all about? It's not just to go up on a mountain. Well, I don't want to get ahead of myself, so I'll leave you there. We'll find out what the transfiguration's about next week. So you have to come back now. So Jesus, man, you're up in Caesarea Philippi, hanging out with him. And you just found out you found the Messiah. 
Couldn't be better, right? That had to be the most glorious feeling those guys ever had. But then along with that revelation came a little bit deeper revelation. Hey guys, I'm the real Messiah. Not the Messiah that some people have made up, but I'm the real Messiah. And I'm coming the first time to die for the sin of man. That's why I'm coming. I'm coming back the second time to set up my kingdom. We'll take care of that. But the first time, I have to die. I have to go to that cross. There's no other way. So I get uptight when people say, well, do you think, do you think it's okay, you know, if people believe this? No, I don't think it's okay. They can be completely sincere, but it's not okay. Peter was totally sincere when he rebuked him, but it wasn't okay. There is one way to heaven. That's through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the cross, period. Now, some people say, man, you know, that's a problem with Christianity. It's so exclusive. No, all you have to do is come. You want to be part of it? Just come. Well, I don't want to. Now, you're being exclusive because I'm inviting you because here's what I know. Anybody, anybody can come to the cross. Let's stand up and pray. Father, as we think about this section and really how, how frightening that had to have been for those guys, how terrifying for somebody to stand there and tell you, you gotta pick up your cross and follow me, man. And Lord, I know that sometimes there's things that get revealed to us through scripture that are overwhelming. Maybe even in some of our hearts, unbelievable. But I know 11 of those guys, they did pick up their cross. And they found life greater than what they ever imagined. And I know from my own experience, when I died to self, I found life. And there's hundreds of testimonies in this room that would go the same way. So I thank you, Jesus. I thank you that you challenge us, even, even today for those of us who know that we know what a great reminder, what a great challenge for us to always come back to the cross, to reignite that flame that's in our heart. And so God, we do wanna go out and here's what we wanna do. We wanna go out those doors carrying our cross, not wearing a cross around our neck, not putting one on our car, but carrying that cross, knowing, knowing that self doesn't exist, but life exists in you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for our sin. Thank you for being our God. And I'm gonna ask you to stay in a, in, a, in a place of prayer for just a couple more minutes. And if you're here today, man, I just wanna challenge you. Today is the day of salvation. And you know, maybe you've come to Calvary Chapel for 15 years, maybe 20 years, or maybe this is your first time. But if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know Jesus the way that he explained it today, then you need to come to the cross. You need to admit to him that you're a sinner. God already knows you're a sinner, but you gotta come to the place where you know you're a sinner. That's why, that's, listen, that's why it's confess, important to tell him, yes, Lord, I am a sinner. That's you admitting where you're at. And then you need to be sorry for that sin. And that's the bad news. The good news is Jesus Christ came, as we talked about earlier, and died for that sin. He paid your penalty that you owed. 
In a moment of time, he took on eternity and took your eternal punishment that you deserve. And now he's holding out to you and he's telling you here, it's paid in full. All you have to do is take it. So today, here's how you take it. You call on his name and you tell him, Jesus, forgive me. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And you can say this prayer out loud. You can say this prayer silently. But listen, you got to be sincere. It's got to come from your heart. Maybe you've backslidden and you just decided to come to church today. Well, you know what? You need to front slide. You need to come home, man. Come back to Jesus. Don't get ripped off anymore. So say this prayer with us. If you're watching online, you can say this prayer with us. Jesus, today I confess to you that I am a sinner. And I want to thank you for dying for me. I want to thank you this morning for your forgiveness. And now I want you to come into my heart and change me. Jesus, come into my life and guide me. Today, I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. If that's the cry of your heart and you said that prayer or something like it, you meant it sincerely, I want you to put your hand up in the air, put it high up in the air so we can pray for you, celebrate with you. I see yours there in the, in the middle there. Anyone else? Father, we thank you right now for that individual. And Lord, how great it is to be in your presence as you bring someone to you. And we pray for them right now. I pray that they would just begin to understand your grace and your love. That they would know that that's unconditional and never ending. It's infinite. And they would know that by your blood They've been set free from the bondage of sin by your blood. All of their guilt and their shame is washed away. It's gone. And this morning, right now, they can begin to worship you because now they know you. Now they're truly living. So make that, begin to make that real in their heart and encourage them. And for all of us, God, we want to honor you with our lives. We want to glorify you. And God, we pray that we could be men and women who magnify our God. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.